One of the relatively modern inventions of uh, theistic apologists is a method of apologetics called presuppositional apologetics or presuppositionalism. Strangely enough, there are at least a couple of completely different ideas that go by the same name. For instance, Eric Hovind and Saite and Bruggenkate, as well as Conservapedia, will state that the crux of the argument is that the reason is impossible without God. But other sources, such as Christian Apologetics and Research Ministry, in an article written by Matt Slick, would state that the idea behind this apologetics is that both atheists and theists have different presuppositions, and the atheists' presuppositions prevent them from seeing the truth. This rather glaring inconsistency, ironically, does nothing to prevent Conservapedia, the trustworthy encyclopedia, from including CASM as one of the sources for the article that directly contradicts it. But that is beside the point. Let's just bite into this apologetic and see why both versions of it are entirely irrelevant. First, let's deal with Slick's argument. It goes like this. 1. The theists presuppose the existence of God. The atheists presuppose the non-existence of God. 2. The Bible, which theists presuppose is true, states that atheists cannot possibly know the truth. 3. Therefore, no evidence will convince an atheist to believe that God exists. 4. Therefore, if an atheist does not accept a piece of evidence on any basis, it proves that God exists. This version of the argument is so fallacious that, to entirely debunk it, you just need to turn it around. Like this. 1. The theists presuppose the existence of God. The atheists presuppose the non-existence of God. 2. The Bible, which atheists presuppose is false, states that you need to believe without and despite the evidence. 3. Therefore, no evidence will convince a theist to believe that God does not exist. 4. Therefore, if a theist does not accept a piece of evidence on any basis, it proves this reasoning. But let's deal with it a little bit more meticulously, just to see what traps it has fallen into, if nothing else, purely as a mental exercise. Point number one makes use of a Strowman fallacy by saying that atheists necessarily presuppose the non-existence of God, which is simply not true for the entire group. True, there are people like that, but, by and large, this is not required to be an atheist. In fact, the atheism based on rationalism operates in a basically opposite manner. Such atheists do not believe in the non-existence of God without any evidence, but rather do not believe into the existence of God, be it a Christian God or any other deity for that matter, without any evidence. A slight change in the wording, but it makes all the difference. Point number two, for no reason whatsoever, squeezes all theists into the narrow category of people who believe in the Bible, so, to be generous, into the category of people with beliefs in Abrahamic religions. This is obviously false, and is obviously a result of the author's bias. Strangely enough, this point makes point number one entirely irrelevant, since presupposing that the Bible is true already means that you presuppose that God is true, and, more importantly, makes no use of the second part, namely that atheists presuppose the non-existence of God, since this presupposition is irrelevant to the later chain of logic. A rather important note to make here is that a presupposition that the Bible is true is just that, a presupposition, i.e. this point can be rewarded as, if we assume that the Bible is true, then atheists cannot possibly know the truth. But no reason to believe this if is given anywhere in this argument. Point number three has, for this argument, the unique property of logically following the assumption from the previous point to reach a conclusion. Too bad that the assumption is still completely unbased. Point number four, though, is where the argument completely derails and falls into the same pit of circular reasoning we all know as the Bible says it's true, therefore it's true. Remember, we still haven't seen any reason to presuppose the truth of the Bible in this argument. 
So, if we do not do that, this conclusion is absolutely wrong. And if we have reasons to presuppose the truth of the Bible, then we do not need this argument to begin with. Unless... Well, I'll get back to that later. For now, let's just say that a logically sound variant of this would look like this. 1. If the Bible is true, then the passage in it stating that atheists cannot know the truth is true. 2. Therefore, if the Bible is true, no amount of evidence will convince an atheist to believe that God exists. And let's remember this for later. Until then, let's get to the other variation of the presuppositional argument. This one is a lot more obscure in its reasoning, but at its core it goes like this. 1. People use logical reasoning to validate various premises. 2. The validity of logical reasoning is, in itself, a premise. 3. One cannot validate logical reasoning with logical reasoning. 4. God, an independent source, can validate logical reasoning with a revelation. 5. Therefore, logical reasoning cannot be valid without God. 6. People use logical reasoning as if it is valid. 7. Therefore, God exists. At first glance, this change seems to make sense. However, at closer inspection, it has some serious problems. Firstly, this argument, just as its other variant, fails to give any reason to believe that the independent source is the Christian God, or even an Abrahamic God, or even a God at all. In fact, all this hypothetical source needs is the knowledge of logical reasoning validity and an ability to reveal this knowledge to the people. No omnipotence, omniscience, omnipresence, omnibenevolence, or any other omni. No creating the universe, earth or humankind. No need to propose laws or punish those who break them while rewarding faith in this hypothetical entity. Nothing else. Secondly, and most importantly, it fails to establish a proper connection between point 6 and 7. Rephrased, point number 6 would be 6. People assume logical reasoning is valid and use it. And this completely destroys the conclusion made in point number 7, because it destroys the need for the divine revelation to make such an assumption. Indeed, there is a perfectly natural explanation as to why people assume that logical reasoning is true. A person who does not assume the validity of, say, causation, would not think that stepping off a cliff would result in a fall, which would result in this person's death. Well, to drive any sort of lesson for this, you need to use the same logical reasoning that a hypothetical reason denialist failed to utilize. This circular reasoning does not mean that the conclusion is wrong. Remember, using a fallacy to reach a conclusion does not mean that the conclusion is necessarily wrong. This is a so-called fallacy fallacy. That's why, even though the Bible says it's true, therefore it's true, is circular reasoning, it does not mean that the Bible is necessarily false. Believe me, there are other reasons to say that it is false anyway. Yes, at its roots, the logical reasoning boils down to a circular reasoning. Logical reasoning is valid because it works and therefore is valid. But that neither makes it invalid nor makes any sort of conclusions about the existence or non-existence of any deity or any other supernatural being. That's just what happens when you try to get the, to the root of something fundamental. At some point, you have nowhere deeper to dig. As an example, let's just imagine we were talking about feelings. Most of us would not like to be stabbed with a knife, not just for various logical reasons, but also because it would be painful. And that would be bad because we don't like pain. And we don't like pain because it's painful. The naturalistic explanation here would be the same. Those who ignore this circular reasoning trap because they, they don't find pain painful would die out. 
This explanation does not require any sort of supernatural being that reveals that pain is bad. And that's where it gets interesting. You see, there is a very rare medical condition known as congenital analgesia, also known as congenital insensitivity to pain, or CIP, a result of a couple possible mutations. And the same can be said about logical reasoning, the only difference being that there is much, much more conditions that break it down in one way or another. These are known as mental disorders. Sure, not all of them work like that. Some increase or decrease emotions and emotional responses, some change personality, some behaviors. But, for example, any kind of delusion would certainly fit the bill. When a person suffers from delusions, he regards something as true despite lacking any sort of proof. In fact, having proof to the contrary, thus circumventing any logical reasoning. In fact, the definition of delusions is a persistent false belief that is maintained despite evidence to the contrary. Hey, wait a minute! Haven't we heard this definition somewhere before? Kidding aside, this highlights a rather grandiose case of projection that the presuppositional argument produces. Instead of using the logical reasoning to prove the existence of their God, theists using it are trying to undermine the concept of logical reasoning itself and squeeze their God into the resulting gap. They assert that it's not them who are not using reason, it's others. And this perfectly explains what the presuppositional apologetics, both versions, are. They are not arguments. They are not used to persuade anyone that God exists, which its proponents happily acknowledge themselves. No. They are defense mechanisms, used to convince yourself that the belief you hold is true. That is why they are utterly and completely irrelevant at any argument. Unless you believe in God already, you have no reason to presuppose God's existence as a default position. Even if you are a theist, it is still not convincing if you have the slightest shred of intellectual honesty to assume the stance of an atheist for the sake of testing the validity of these arguments, because you will see that they are ultimately pointless mental equilibristics that are used to provide a no-lose scenario and put yourself in a warm and comfy bubble that it creates, dismissing every argument made against you out of hand, saying that whatever the argument was, it just proved you right, until the people who care enough to argue with you would just leave you alone in this circular, self-pleasuring state. In conclusion, if you are an atheist confronted with this sort of apologetics, don't even bother to argue against it, since it's not used against you. And if you are a theist, don't fall into a trap of using it, because with it you assume one of the most intellectually dishonest positions possible at the same time protecting yourself from your own critical thinking and logical reasoning. Lastly, I would like to point out that the second version of the presuppositional apologetics is also false for another reason. Unlike the first version, one can hypothetically make predictions based on it. Oh, you just know you're gonna like this. Firstly, since Christian God is omnibenevolent, he would reveal the truth of logical reasoning to everyone equally, thus making mental disorders such as delusions, other religions, and atheism impossible. This is typically refuted by the idea that some people, which actually means most people if you think about it, just ignore these revelations in favor of their own convictions or are deceived by evil forces. This, however, brings up another problem. How would anyone knowing that atheists, Christians, Muslims and delusional people exist would determine which one of them is right? The answer given is that the revelations not only provide the proof of logical reasoning, but also tell other stuff, such as which God is true. But not only does this not uncover anything to answer the question, since an outsider question his or her beliefs wouldn't be able to tell which one of these people is actually getting their revelations from a deity, and which are just lying to themselves, or being lied to, but also creates a prediction that is evidently false. If God 
puts information about him into each and every person on the planet, then there should have been churches of the one true God sprawling everywhere in the world before the missionaries arrive. Or at the very least a couple or so people who have never heard of the one true God from anyone else and yet already knew of his or her existence. Native Americans or Australian Aborigines having a church of Jesus Christ, Allah or Vishnu before any explorer found them would be a very strong evidence for these religions, but unfortunately for them this never happened. And well there you go, a hypothesis that fails to explain reality is discarded by the scientific method. Hopefully this was informative or at the very least entertaining for you. Please rate and comment whether you like this video or not, whether you agree or disagree with the points that it makes, and if you did like it, you might want to subscribe to my channel. Thanks for watching.